This is Rogers TV. Rogers TV Durham would like to acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation of the Mississauga Nation. May we respectfully honor the knowledge and understanding of the indigenous stewards of these ancestral lands and ensure that the voices of the First Peoples are represented in our collections, programs and services. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers Cable or Rogers TV. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talk Politics. Welcome to 2024. I'm Deborah Hutchison. Our guest this week, our first guest of the new year, is with the MP Ryan Turnbull. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to see good you again. To be, good to be here again. It's always a pleasure to join the show. And I guess before we, we get on to uh, any topics politically, I have to congratulate you before anything else. 2023 was a very good year for the Turnbull family. You became a new papa right before Christmas. Yes, I did. We welcomed uh, our new little girl to our family on December 15th, uh, early in the morning. And uh, uh, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and now we have uh, a newborn baby girl, and uh, we couldn't be happier. Couldn't Not getting be. much sleep yet? Uh, well, the sleep, <laughs> sleep is not a priority right now. It's just taking care of <laughs> of baby and making sure the baby is take, uh, gaining weight and she's doing really good though both oh. my wife and my daughter alexis are doing great and the new baby is doing fantastic her name is brooke so is alexis um a really willing big sister is she just all in there funny uh, you should say that she's asked for a baby sister for christmas every single year for about 10 years since she could talk so she finally got what she wanted for christmas Oh, that is awesome. Well, congratulations once again to you and Susie and the family. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, so let's let's get to uh, uh, what we're here to talk about. I, I know you wanted to address the economic update from the fall uh, economic statement, the good and the bad news. So do you want to start with the good or do you want to start with the bad? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, it's uh, it's always a mixed bag. I mean, you're never going to have the the perfect scenario, but I think uh, in general, there's some good news in the fall economic statement uh, with regards to our economy. I know Canadians probably aren't experiencing, you know, the the sort of global numbers, and you know, certainly people's lived experience, uh, and I'm very empathetic to that. That people are still feeling the pressures of inflation in our economy, and that's that's. Their lived experience is real. So uh, I don't want to come across as unsympathetic to that, but there is some good news on the horizon. Uh, Canada has the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. We have the lowest deficit in the G7. We still have maintained or renewed our AAA credit rating, which means the cost to carry our debt is relatively low compared to many other countries. Uh, general inflation was down uh, when the fall economic statement came out. We'll have to see new numbers that are updated on a regular basis, but it does look like inflation is coming down. Uh, you can remember back to, uh, you know, uh, over uh, a year ago where it was up around 8%. It's now hovering around 3% and hopefully uh, going down. So unemployment is actually historically low as well. It's gone up a little bit, but it's uh, when you look at the graph over time, it's like the lowest it's been, or it hit the lowest in my lifetime. So I'm 46 years old. They started um, recording unemployment uh, in 1976, so the year before I was born, and unemployment rate in Canada was really low. So that's a good news. More people are working in Canada than almost ever before. Um, and Canada is the third in the world in terms of foreign direct investment which is very good news for us because we're bringing in a lot of investment um, into the country. And it, it's 
sort of a sign that that people, even though the uh, economic realities in the world are a little bit questionable, and there's anxiety out there in in markets in the global markets that investors are putting their money in Canada because they believe that our economy is going to be more prosperous and is more stable and it's better investment uh, to make. So I think, you know, that's good news. Uh, the last piece of good news, I think, is that Canada's economy is projected by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to, to be the highest growth or one of the highest um, growth potential for 2024. So uh, they're looking at projections that are later in 2024, but that's good news for us as well. So I think the bad news is, you know, interest rates, Bank of Canada interest rates are still high. People are, there's anxiety about that. Grocery prices are still uh, higher than we want them to be. Um, there's the lived experience of people in Canada that I think they're quite concerned and there's anxiety out there. So we're hoping that we can continue to, uh, take out some of the pressures in in the economy and bring down inflation to the degree that a government can, and um, and hopefully we'll see things uh, get a lot better in 2024. I'm very hopeful and optimistic about 2024. Yeah, I was going to ask you, when am I going to feel this in my pocketbook? When am I going to feel some of the good news and reap the rewards then of all this this good news? Well, it's hard to predict. Um, as you can imagine, it would be a pretty big risk for me to to put out some big generalized statements and then, you know, have that be, you know, painfully wrong. Not that I'm opposed to taking risks. I think you have to, to get anywhere in politics, get anywhere in life. But I think, you know, I think what I'm trying to do is say that relative to a lot of other contexts that 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 people could be in, in terms of countries around the world, Canada is faring a lot better considering we just went through uh, once in a hundred year uh, public health crisis, and we're not in the Great Depression, right? We're not even in a technically a recession. Uh, people have been, you know, toying with the idea of that there's going to be a recession. It looks like from all the evidence that we've gathered is that things are getting better. Inflation's coming down. Uh, you know, there's some of the prices of different products and things that Canadians use are, are starting to come down. So I think there's there's a moderate impact already on people's pocketbooks. It's not going to be one big, you know, uh, reduction in prices that you're all of a sudden going to feel drastically. I think the big thing that people will feel the most is when uh, hopefully Bank of Canada interest rates start to come down. I think that will alleviate some of the anxiety that's out there. And uh, we don't have control over that, but uh, I think the signs are, are, sh are showing positive indications that hopefully the Bank of Canada will uh, lower their interest rates in the near future, which I'm I'm very you much. You talk about on. prices coming down. You know, I've noticed over the last year, housing prices have come down, but they are still so far out of reach for most Canadians. Let's let's talk about affordable housing. Um, and I know you wanted to mention some national initiatives that you say are making a difference. Well, they're starting to. I mean, I think uh, what's interesting is the affordable housing sort of crisis or problem we have in this country is is one that um, that we've been addressing. Um, you know, one could critically look at the government and say, well, are we doing enough? I think it's interesting when you look historically at the last 30 or 40 years of uh, political parties at the federal level, there was zero investment in housing. So from my assessment of the problem, and I think many people agree, many experts agree that because successive governments for 30, over 30 years, so three decades, didn't make any investments in housing, uh, and the market was left to itself, essentially, the, the housing that we're building is more and more profitable. It's bigger homes, more detached homes, more urban sprawl, um, you know, especially in, in and around the GTA, um, but this applies right across the country. So, and there's speculation in the market. There was, so there's all kinds of things that are contributing uh, to the challenges that people experience. Um, but I think our government has taken it seriously from day one. Not a lot of people recognize that. I find that people are kind of misinformed on this. They think the federal government is just now acting on housing. Well, we invested $82 billion and developed the national housing strategy, which has um, helped over 500,000 people uh, own or stay in a home um, if they were at risk of homelessness. Uh, and so we've been doing a lot of work in this area. I would say the market conditions and the economy 
have pushed the problem way beyond what we've been able to accomplish in terms of that national housing strategy. So now we're having to add new measures on, and and I think we need to do that because we need to get at the cause of the problem. So the things that we're doing, I think, are um, bigger and more systemic in nature rather than funding programs to help you know nonprofit housing providers build new housing. It's it's way beyond that. We're saying let's lift the GST from new rental construction, which is a bill we got passed through Parliament, uh, which you know will unlock about three hundred thousand new units of housing. Uh, I mean, rental housing construction units, but uh, that's going to unlock those developers that wanted to build that housing. What we know is that, you know, the market is complex. It's a complex problem. When you have more rental housing, which we have a, a limited supply of right now, people will move into those rental apartments. It will, you know, there there's other aspects of the housing market that then can grow and develop as a result of people having rental housing. They're, yeah, you know, I, sorry, I was going to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm older than you, than you, and I remember growing up, there was a lot of rental housing out there. These days, all I see being built are the standalone homes, townhomes, yeah. not a lot of rental. Why is that? Well, because it's more profitable, I think, for developers is, is my assessment. Um, uh, um, I, I, you know, maybe I should... Um, uh, put a caveat on that. It, it's hard to it's hard to say. I mean, the you know the the market is so complex, but I think it's more profitable to build uh, big uh, you know homes that uh, earn a premium for the property. But then w- when I think about it, building up in terms of high rises is also profitable because your your the footprint of the land that you have to acquire is rather small, and you're allowed to build up, and so. Um, part of it is a balance, right? I think it's a balance of like, what are the needs of the population as it grows? I think, you know, we've heard the connection with immigration and international students. They're not going to be in a position to buy a home. So there's rental yeah. housing needed for them. See, a lot of seniors want to sell their their detached homes if they have them cash in on the equity and then rent a, a place that's affordable and accessible for them. And so there needs to be movement in the market in, you know, so if the market has sort of a, uh, it's congested or it's, uh, you know, there's a blockage in it, then people can't move from naturally from one part of the market to another. And then you get a, you know, get a problem that that really arises. Anyway, point is, uh, you know, lifting GST is big. The, the housing accelerator fund is really big. This is, I did housing uh, development for, with nonprofits before I got into politics. It was very difficult work and almost always, we found the major uh, block was muni- working with the municipalities. And it wasn't that the municipalities were bad to work with. It's that they have the Planning Act, which is, you know, a piece of provincial policy in all the provinces and territories. They have acts that that essentially have all kinds of regulation attached to them as to how you can build and all the things you have to do in order to, to build housing. So the municipalities are bound within that act to follow that. And so there's a bureaucracy and there's a lot of rules and and a lot of processing that has to happen at municipal levels. You have to get zoning and, you know, there's all these different approvals and uh, variations and, you know, all kinds of things. There's a complexity to it. So we're, we're working with municipalities and helping fund additional capacity so they can speed up the approval process, which will also speed up housing construction. We also have launched the first home savings accounts where, uh, and this has been really successful. Apparently the uptake is really large, uh, way faster and larger than we had thought, which is that you can open a a bank account and save money for your first home tax-free. So it's a great way to start saving for a young family or a young person uh, that wants to eventually purchase a home. They can save tax-free. So that's good. The last thing I'll say is uh, Minister Fraser, uh, right before the holiday season, uh, announced uh, something that I advocated for, which I'm very excited about, which is a kind of a renewal or consultation process about wartime, a wartime kind of approach or post-war approach where you get pre-approved designs for different types of housing. And these would be pre-approved. So municipalities would already essentially um, have approved them in advance. And so you could you know, you could 
uh, shorten the time frame for that approval process dramatically. And you could have, you know, something financed and shovels in the ground instead of it being a two or three year planning cycle before shovels get in the ground, you might shorten it to 12 months or less. Like that's a big deal if you want to build a lot of housing and we need to build millions of units of new housing in this country in order to solve the supply issue. Um, Anyway, housing is complex because there's also speculation in the market. There's the the real estate industry. There's there was the challenge of people buying up properties uh, in Canada that were that were not living in Canada. They were from outside of Canada, and we've uh, we've stamped. So, I think these things as a package uh, will really start to make a difference, and I think we're already seeing that. There's a lot of excitement, um, in my view in terms of the things that we're doing uh, from a lot of the experts uh, in the industry. Okay, I'm gonna stop you there. We're going to go to a quick break. We are in conversation with Whitby MP Ryan Turnbull. Don't go away. of Chicago Wednesday return January 17th on City TV. Remember me? Let's get to work. Just like old times. Looks like we're going for a ride. We're doing this my way. Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. Our next show will be live from the Town Hall Theater in Port Perry. My guests will be dancer Jasmine Ravel and singer Erwin Smith. Both will feature some fantastic Christmas music. Please join us right here on Rogers TV. If you like timeless movie topics, then you're in luck. For this new series, Cinema Scene Themes, featuring guest-selected genres, has you covered. It's insightful, humorous, and altogether cinematic. This is Rogers TV. And welcome back to Talk Politics. Our guest this week is with the MP Ryan Turnbull. We were talking about affordability, housing affordability before the break. I want to talk about food prices. Every time, every I dread going to the grocery store every week. I can't believe how much I'm spending on food. What is the federal government doing to help my food bill, Ryan? Great. Well, we did a grocery rebate, which is a, a small, a very small contribution to people. It's an extra GST uh, uh, tax credit sort of payment. Uh, so lower income families, uh, you know, got a little bit of help uh, through that. But that's not all we're doing. That's just one uh, small measure. It's, a, you know, a direct support um, for low income families. The other thing that we've done, which, mo again, more systemically and broader, is to really try and hold uh, the grocery chains accountable. In this country, you probably know we have five grocery chains or five companies really that own or and operate large chains that um, essentially have about 80% of the market share in the country. So that's a highly consolidated grocery uh, industry in Canada, which is not great. So our view is we need more competition if we want to lower prices, which is what the Competition Bureau said. When I was on the committee that analyzed this and did all the work on this, um, but what I what I want to do is empathize with Canadians first because I really feel it too. I think everybody feels it. Um, and when you go to the grocery store, what is troubling is seeing record profits in the mm -hmm. grocery industry at a time when Canadians are struggling. And when we looked at the problem, we see that although the, the let, let let me be clear, like the margins in the grocery industry are very slim. They are very slim, uh, but they they have doubled their profits and their sales volumes have not gone up dramatically. So the point is, how are they making more money if they're not increasing their prices? Um, and so so they are. I mean, we know that their, their gross margins are, are double. The point is, what is the government doing? The government has called them to Ottawa to account. We, we asked them to create plans to reduce prices or stabilize prices. What the problem is, is that we see general inflation has come down dramatically and grocery prices have not come down uh, with general inflation. 
So the consumer price index shows general inflation. And what we see is grocery prices are still way higher than what general inflation. So when we say stabilize grocery prices, we mean bring down those prices to be in alignment with the general inflation, which, which would be a dramatic difference. So what grocery chains have done is they've offered uh, deeper discounts. Uh, they've offered more price matching. They've done some price freezes over the holidays. We've set up a task force to be monitoring this uh, so that we know whether they're actually following through on their action plans or not. They've recently come to committee and said that they wouldn't have done many of the measures that they've put in place uh, if uh, we hadn't have called them to Ottawa and held them to account. I mean, we sort of said to them, look, like, if you want us to tax you more, we can, but we'd like to give you an opportunity to address the needs of 40 million Canadians before we do that. And so we took a kind of a, you know, an approach that was more constructive with them, hoping that they would work with us. I think they've done some, some. Uh, I don't know whether it's enough. I feel like it's not enough yet. Uh, so we're reassessing. Uh, but the other thing that we're doing, which is very significant, is we've amended our competition laws. The Competition Act gives the Competition Bureau powers to investigate and uh, compel uh, data and and uh, be able to really get to the bottom of what's happening in the grocery industry. So uh, we've given the Competition Bureau more powers. We've gotten that uh, bill through Parliament and um, right before Christmas. And so there will be changes coming. We're going to make more amendments to the Competition Act in the fall economic statement has more. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, we'll be able to hold them to task and to account and really understand, you know, where they're making more money because they've said that they're making more money on health and beauty products. And I, I'm not sure I, I completely buy that. Okay. Uh, we only got about five and a half minutes left. So let's move on to um, health care. Uh, a dental care, dental care for seniors. We've got a plan in place, but I, I must tell you, when I heard about it, that it was for seniors at the beginning, 87 and up, I thought, <laughs> how many 87 year old seniors still have their own teeth? That's a yeah. little late to beginning. Yeah, so it's actually for for everybody. So it's for, uh, we estimate about 9 million Canadians who do not have uh, dental coverage will be able to access uh, the new dental plan. Uh, this is a dental plan that's for uninsured individuals or people that don't have uh, insurance coverage. Uh, so, and it's not just for seniors; it's for anybody that that is of a that meets the income threshold. Um, it is being rolled out in stages, so it's not for seniors that are 87 and older. It's just where we're starting. Um, so, December the first intake, and what we're trying to do is roll out the intake process in stages so that 9 million Canadians don't all apply at once and then are all disappointed with the level of service that they're getting, which I think would be a major mistake uh, right. given the fact that we're the federal government and we want to provide good service. And that hasn't always been the case. I can acknowledge there's things that we've rolled out that have not been optimally rolled out and we're trying to do that better. And we're thinking through, well, how do we make sure that we um, standardize uh, and and give a, a quality of service that people would expect, that the general public should expect when the federal government rolls out a big program like this. So seniors age 87 and above was starting in December. We have uh, seniors age 77 to 86 in January. February is 72 to 76. March is 70 to 71 because that's where the largest number of seniors are right. that are uninsured. So yeah. all of this, and then it goes down to 65 to 69. And then anyway, so it rolls out in stages and eventually it will open up because most people will have applied and it'll just open up and be open to, to everybody. But, uh, you know, children under 18 years old will be eligible um, uh, and individuals who uh, have a valid disability tax credit. So if you're living with a disability, you'll be able to access it too. So it, it's really great. Um, it's tiered as well. So there's a little bit of complexity to depending on how much income you have, you get a, uh, more coverage uh, versus right. a little bit less, which I think is good as well. Uh, so if you have a little bit more income, you maybe can afford to pay a little bit towards it and, and the government's going to cover the rest. And ultimately the taxpayer is going to cover the rest. It's a, it's a big ticket item, um, you know, but it's going to really help a lot of Canadians. So 9 million Canadians will be able to access dental care um, that is medically necessary 
um, as a result of this. Okay, two and a half minutes left. I'm counting you down. Um, <laughs> I also want to talk about the suicide prevention hotline. Yeah, Great this news. is a big. This is really good news. You know, there's. Um, I'm told that there's about 200 people uh, every day that uh, attempt suicide in Canada, which is just just jaw dropping and heartbreaking to think about. Uh, there's 4,500 Canadians who've lost their lives to suicide each year. And um, so we've put $158 million into this project, worked with CAMH, uh, and we now have launched a 988 uh, hotline. It's a suicide prevention hotline. If you're, if anyone out there is ever considering or thought about, you know, um, ending their life, they can text or call that number and get a human being on the other end to talk to at any time, 24 seven, no matter where you live in Canada. This is a huge deal. We've wanted to do this for a long time. It's been needed and people need someone to reach out to and talk to. And that in itself can prevent uh, many, many, I'm sure many, many um, attempts uh, to take their own life. So we really hope that people use that and, um, you know, to anybody out there that um, needs help or wants to talk to someone, all you have to do is dial 988. Okay. Uh, we've only got about a minute left. Uh, did you want to talk about climate change? I always want to talk about climate change, but I know. Uh, you also had some other questions for me. So maybe we'll uh, save that for another time. I think you had a couple of questions for me. Well, I know you also wanted to quickly talk about um, health transfers and bilateral agreements. We've only got about 30 seconds, though. So. Yeah, I don't think we'll have the time, but maybe I can just mention that uh, we've increased health care funding and we're holding provinces to account. Uh, that's the role that the federal government sees for itself. And what we want to see is major improvements to our uh, health care system. And we know that that's needed. The bilateral agreements are uh, on top of that, and they're uh, being negotiated. Uh, and uh, there's there's four main pillars. And uh, I probably can't get into the details on that, but uh, I think it will be very significant for Ontario's health care system. And uh, we hope that the province will use those funds to dramatically improve uh, the quality of care. And on that, we are out of time. Ryan, we'll have to have you back. This has been a total pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure every time. Thanks, Deborah. Our guest this week has been Whitby MP Ryan Turnbull. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, I'm Deborah Hutchison. Bye for now. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. Salt? Salt? Toast is burning? Toast is not. She smells something burning. Now, if we can provoke that smell by probing the surface of the brain, we'll find the source of the seizures. Mrs. Gold, do you feel anything? I can see the most wonderful lights. And now what do you feel? Did you pour cold water on my hand, Dr. Penfield? Now what? Uh, what is it, Mrs. Gold? Burnt toast. Dr. Penfield, I can smell burnt toast. Dr. Wilder Penfield. He cured my seizures and hundreds more. They say he drew the roadmap of the human brain. We just called him the greatest Canadian alive. These days at your local Legion, we're marching to the beat of a different drum on a mission to support veterans, to have fun, and to welcome everyone to our ranks. You don't have to be a veteran to join the Legion. And as a